Hi, thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Florian, and as you've heard, my current title is the Head of Technology for Southeast Asia. But most of my professional life, I've been working with ThoughtWorks as a consultant and as a software developer. So what you're hearing from us today is really from that experience of working with, uh, with uh, organizations across different industry on building exciting new products, helping them build infrastructure and application platforms, making sure that they can deliver value to the market, run the applications safely and securely, run them in a nice way. Um, and I'll hand it over, and I have with me here today, uh, my colleague Isa. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Isa. So I'm a software consultant at ThoughtWorks for about two years plus now. So uh, I was mainly doing like uh, mobile application development uh, in my first year before switching into my current project, uh, which is more like infrastructure focused and also allow me to delve more into like how to automate infrastructure deployment. Uh, it's testing and ach achieving compliance at the same time. So I hope to share some of these like practical experience of testing compliance and also testing in general uh, through this session today. Yeah. Hi, yes, so let's get started. So what is this all about what we're going to talk about today, right? So you've heard the words, right? You've heard that something about security, about compliance, about automation, but that sounds a bit weird, right? So let me phrase it in a slightly different way. This talk is about this unhappy face of mine. Um, this is a slightly younger version of me working in one of our banking clients in Thailand. And this is a picture of me a couple of weeks before we were supposed to launch a brand new product for this bank, something that creates a lot of value for the organization, makes loan applications a lot easier to, uh, to their clients. So this is an exciting project, right? This is the things we want to create as developers and uh, as engineers. So why do I have this unhappy, grumpy face in this picture? Well, the reason is that instead of putting the finishing touches on this interesting product, I spent these last few weeks before the launch in paperwork. I spent the last few weeks digging through Excel sheets with hundreds and hundreds of lines of criteria of reading Amazon's SOC 2 compliance report that has 200, 300 pages, if I remember correctly. I've spent most of my time trying to make sure and to prove to everyone involved in this organization that we had crossed our T's, dotted our I's, that we had done a good job into building security into our product, into making it safe so it doesn't affect the, the customers and it doesn't affect the organization in any negative way. Right? And I'm guessing some of you have had similar experiences. Right? As developers, we often see compliance and security as something that slows us down. Right? We see it as something that we need to do before a release, right? then it prevents us from releasing. That is a tedious manual, very bureaucratic process that slows us down, that increases our time to market. And we would much rather spend this time on building new interesting features for our stakeholders, right? We think that security compliance is something that's boring and repetitive, and it's just a hassle for everyone involved, right? So not a good thing, right? If you think about it, if you think about it that way, however, I'm also consulting with the security side of many of our clients. I'm consulting with the infrastructure people who need to keep these applications running, who need to make sure that they're running in a secure way. I'm dealing with the security and the compliance people who have their own constraints and who need to protect the organization from certain things, right? And they have a very different view when it comes to having a new release out, right? What a security or compliance professional thinks about is much more about that change introducing new risks to the organization, right? We launch a new product, we create a new release for something, that's potential to open up new vulnerabilities that a bad actor can exploit, right? It is something that might endanger our customers, it might endanger our organization because it's no, our releases are no longer compliant with regulations, laws, policies. 
right? So what security and audit and compliance professionals also almost often see is danger, right? There's something that's dangerous and that we want to really make sure we get right. So who is right then? How do we go from here? Is one side right and the other side is wrong in this case? Not really, right? Sure, as developers, releasing software into production is how we create value, right? Software is no good if it's running in a test environment. It needs to be in production in front of our users, in front of citizens, in front of customers to create any real value, right? So how we create that value is through making changes to our production systems and rolling out these new interesting things. However, if we roll out these changes while breaking our security and our compliance posture, we are not creating any value at all. In fact, we're destroying value for the organization. We're endangering our users, right? So both of these sides have their truth to them. So what do we do then if we have something that we perceive as tedious, as repetitive, as a hassle, but it's also really important to get right and to get it right every single time. Well, in IT, we have an answer to that, right? It's what we've been doing for decades now. We let a computer do these kinds of things, right? Computers are really good at doing the same thing over and over again and getting it right every single time. So what we wanna talk about today is how can we look at security and compliance and audits in a way that is automatable as something that a computer can. And we wanna do that by walking you through a couple of statements that often pop up in requirements around security and compliance and translate them into something that we might be able to automate. So let's get started. The first one you will often see is something around the OWASP top 10, right? A requirement that says that the organization must ensure that all our applications are protected against the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, right? Very standard phrasing that you will find in a requirements document, for example. For the ones who haven't heard of the OWASP top 10, these are basically a list of the top 10 most frequently made mistakes when it comes to web applications. Right? It's a list of things that we always get wrong when we build applications. So another way of phrasing this is, we don't want you to make any commonly made mistakes while you're building your software. So how can we automate that? Well, first approach, we look at our code, right? If we're able to find out what a commonly made mistake looks like in our code, but then we can use static analysis to find these kinds of patterns, these kinds of snippets of codes that indicate that something is wrong, that we have made a mistake, that we potentially have a security vulnerability there. We call it a static application security testing or SAS in short. And you will find open source as well as commercial tools for pretty much all the languages out there. And what they will produce is an output like what you see on the right hand side of the slide here. They will produce a snippet that tells you, here's a piece of code, right? In this case, it's somewhere in the user repo class that has a particular pattern that indicates a vulnerability. In this case, what we have found is that we have taken some input from the user and without really checking it too much, concatenating that into an SQL statement and putting it out into a database, right? This is more or less a textbook's definition of, an SM, uh, of a SQL injection vulnerability, right? And it's easily detectable by looking at what kind of calls is the code making, where's the data coming from, what kind of methods is it calling, so on and so forth, right? So the tool can find these kinds of patterns and flag them for you and say, here's a piece of code that you need to look at. Here's where's and where the vulnerability is. So really straightforward tool that you can apply to your code on day one. Um, the tools here on the slide um, are some of the open source uh, tools that are out there for things like Ruby, .NET, JVM, Python. Um, if you're in the GovTech ecosystem, then you might also have access to a commercial tool from, from Fortify 
plus many other commercial tools are available that do something similar as well. Right? So that can be a quick way of looking through security vulnerabilities in your code by identifying these commonly made mistakes and finding these patterns in your code base. The second way you might want to look for commonly made mistakes is the way a QA or the way a pen tester would look at your code, right? They might have a look inside your code base and have a look around what's going on in there, but they might also spend a lot of time just poking your application from the outside, right? Try to understand how it works and try to find ways how we can misuse the application in ways that might introduce strange behavior, might introduce security problems. Um, and some of this, I must admit, is really hard, really creative work. And you'll need good pen testers and good QAs who will come up with the most creative way of using your application. However, there's also a large amount of work that isn't very creative. That simply consists in throwing a lot of different payloads at your system and seeing if anything goes wrong. And this is something that we absolutely can automate. The word for that is called dynamic application security testing, or DAST. Um, OWASAP is a tool in that space that is open source, ready for anyone to use. If you're looking for commercial solutions, there might be Burp Suite. Um, the Fortify that you will get from GovTech also has these, uh, these kinds of products. Um, no matter what kind of product you're using, they will probably give you an output like what you see on the slide, right? So in this case, we have the same application that we saw before, but now we're looking at it from the outside. And we found out that there's a session endpoint and it takes a vendor input as a post parameter. And what the tool has done here, it has taken a valid input, the HVAC company in this case, and it's modified it a bit in ways similar to what an attacker would do, right? It added these quote and one equals one things to it. And what it found out is that if you do that, you can actually log in, right? You get a positive response when actually you should be getting a negative one, right? Again, indicating something is weird, something is strange here, this might be a SQL injection, right? So these tools are a bit more work setting up compared to a static analysis, but can find interesting things that you might not find a static analysis. Putting those two together, you actually have very decent chances of finding some of these commonly made mistakes that people make um, and already give you a big boost when it comes to security. These are the first tools that any good security analyst will throw at your system to find out if there are any common vulnerabilities before they look at anything else. So well, this covers your own code, right? But what we are deploying is not just our own code, we're also deploying a lot of or someone else's code. We're deploying operating system packages. We're deploying frameworks, libraries, all this kind of stuff. And we're not the only ones making mistakes, right? The people who are building these frameworks and these libraries also make mistakes. The beauty is for those commonly used things, there are databases out there that can tell us which pieces of code are vulnerable, what the vulnerability is, what versions are affected and how you fix them. So if we want to protect ourselves from these vulnerabilities in third party components, what we need to do is we need to look at our dependency tree and map that against, uh, against these vulnerability databases. And of course there are tools out there that can do that. The ones on the slides, uh, what you're seeing here is for example, a tool called Privy um, that looks at Docker containers and the operating system packages in there, but also the application that you put into your uh, Docker container. And what I found in this case, for example, is that we're using a version of the Spring Framework, version 4.3.2, that has a vulnerability that is very severe, right? It rates it as a critical severity. Um, and also tells us if we upgrade to version 4.3.16, then we're safe from this vulnerability. So very useful tool is to find these commonly um, used libraries and their vulnerabilities. Um, one thing I wanna call out, um, if you're using GitHub or if you're using some of the other popular in Git hosting uh, tools, then you might have some of this already built in. So think about Dependabot that can give you these things just by looking at your Git repository. 
What they can also do, and that is quite interesting, is they can create pull requests automatically. So you're not just getting vulnerability detection, you're also getting resolution of these same vulnerabilities. I can get a pull request that tells you, here, upgrade this library version to a new version. You can run UCI against that and merge it in without having to, to do too much work in actually patching these vulnerabilities yourself. So all in all, three different categories of tools, um, all really helpful when it, when it comes to making your application more secure. And the beauty is that this isn't just a way to tell you every once in a while that here's a security problem that you might need to fix. The beauty is that you can integrate this into your continuous delivery pipelines. You can run this on every change you make. So when you're making a commit and you make a change, you're not just getting feedback from your testing, but right? it says like functionally everything is okay. You're also getting feedback on the security of the change you're making, which means that while you're still working on the feature you're building, you're getting real-time feedback when you make a mistake, when you introduce any security vulnerabilities, as opposed to six or 12 months down the line when there might be a security audit involved in. Right? It's so really important to get that feedback early. So that covers your application side of things. However, we're not just having our application side of things, right? We also have our applications on top of infrastructure, right? So what you will often see in security requirements is a sense of hardening against certain standards. And the first thing that I want to look at in terms of infrastructure is, right? They're telling us when we say hardening, that we found some kind of rules um, that you need to follow if you want your security to be, uh, to be compliant and secure. If you want your infrastructure, your servers, your uh, networking to really follow best practices. So when someone tells me there's a bunch of rules I need to check against, that sounds like something to me that I can automate. It sounds a bit like testing to me. So but thankfully, there are infrastructure testing tools out there, right? For example, right, you might want to harden your server. There's server spec and inspect out there that allow you to write rules like the one you see on the slide here, right? That allows you to say like, okay, I have this SSH config file here. These are the things it needs to have, right? It needs to be owned by a certain group. Um, some things need to be readable or not readable. Um, you can write these tools in the language like server spec and inspect. Um, and then check it automatically. Um, so that if an auditor comes along and asks you, have you hardened your server against these rules? You can show him, yes, I have, right? I can automate checking these rules um, in, a, in a very fast way. Um, so that's the theory. Let me hand it over to Isa now to talk a little bit about how you actually do that in a larger scale, how she actually worked on this kind of stuff uh, working on a project for GovTech, when, when the requirement comes in, say, hey, we need your servers to be hardened against the CIS standard. Me. Uh, thanks, Florian. So, okay, let's take a closer look at how we can automate the hardening process and also automate um, its testing. So, uh, in the project that I worked in, uh, we follow this uh, CIS benchmark. So uh, as, as the documentation suggests, uh, the CIS benchmark is like a prescriptive guideline um, that helps to provide like a secure configuration posture. So I screenshot one of um, the many rules that uh, CIS benchmark has. Uh, so um, okay, so it's a little bit small, but um, each rule basically has uh, a rationale as to why this rule should be configured and uh, an audit. So an audit, which is basically like a, a command that you can run to check if the rule is applied to your configuration. And then if not, then uh, a remediation. So a remediation is uh, the command that, that you run uh, in order uh, to configure your servers to be secure uh, and pass the audit check. Okay, so uh, as mentioned, there's a lot of these rules and applying these rules one by one um, in each of your servers uh, is probably not scalable and, and prone to mistakes. Uh, so uh, we actually found that there's this uh, Ansible playbook. Uh, 
it's a GitHub repo. Uh, basically, it codifies all the remediation commands. So uh, what we need to do is basically we just run these Ansible scripts and then uh, we output uh, a hardened image. So one, one good thing about uh, running these scripts, it also gives us like uh, the flexibility to uh, toggle on and off uh, which rule that is applicable, applicable to us. So um, these rules are just a guideline, right? So uh, they, they don't always uh, fit uh, to your infrastructure, for example, and maybe you, you, you might not want to apply this rule, uh, then uh, the Ansible scripts provides like toggles for you to uh, turn them off uh, as you deem appropriate. Okay, so now that we have uh, built this uh, hardened image uh, using the Ansible scripts, uh, then we can spin up our instances using uh, this hardened image. So, um, however, we should also kind of like test if our instances are indeed hardened as expected. So to do this, uh, we will spin up like a test instance with the hardened image. And then um, there's another GitHub repo that creates uh, like this inspect tests and it will verify uh, if you have applied all the hardening, the hardening rules as expected. So um, after running this inspect test, it will actually uh, output the results in a JSON format. Yeah. So uh, in our project, we actually uh, made use of these results uh, and then we, uh, we created like a simple report generator. So um, it will display uh, the, the results of the tests uh, in a HTML file uh, like you see in the screenshot. So uh, as you can see, we, we added like a Jira ticket, uh, like a Jira link, uh, so that for example, if, if the test fails, uh, we can refer to uh, the Jira ticket for the reason uh, why it's failed. So maybe we uh, want to add some context as to why it's okay that this test is not passing. Uh, and then um, this, this report also uh, kind of gives us like a, a way uh, to check like which rules we have applied. And then um, maybe if the auditors come along and, and they want to check, okay, which rules have you applied based on this CIS benchmark, uh, then we can easily refer to this report and say that, okay, these are the rules that we have applied, these are the rules that we have not yet to apply, and the reason why it's not applied, you can find more information in the JIRA ticket. Yeah, so uh, in a nutshell, this is basically how we can automate uh, compliance. Thank you, Isa. So this is talking about how you harden the server, but a server isn't the only thing you're deploying into infrastructure, right? Especially if you work on one of the public clouds, there's a lot more stuff going on, right? There is things like IAM roles, there is databases, there is networking and all kinds of other resources that you also need to get right and that you also need to follow certain rules around if you want to keep them secure. And there are testing tools for this kind of infrastructure as well. Right? So think about things like AWS spec and Terraform compliance, um, which you see on the slide here, right? That allow you to write a test on your whole infrastructure, say for example, on your firewall configuration, right? In this example, you say, we're deploying an internal app. We don't really need to expose it to the outside world. So please let's make sure that our firewalls don't open any ports out into the public internet, All right? And this is a rule you can write. You can check, uh, you can automate checking that against your, your AWS account, your Azure account, things like that. To, and again, right, come back to an auditor to tell you, but right, I followed these rules, we're automatically checking it and we're getting real-time feedback on this kind of thing. Another thing I wanna call out is and the open policy agent um, that looks at the same problem slightly differently for different kind of tools. So open policy agent is something that has a bit of a higher learning curve, right? You see it here on the slide, it's a bit harder to read, but it gives you a lot of power for cloud native tools, things like Kubernetes, things like service meshes. Um, these kinds of tools are really powerful, which means it's also a lot more complex to get security right in these circumstances. So Open Policy Agent hooks into these tools and gives you a way to write these security policies on there and enforce them automatically. So 
what we are doing in this uh, snippet, for example, is we're saying we only want hard and secure images that we know about deployed into our Kubernetes cluster. We don't want anyone just deploying things they found on Docker, which might be a reasonable rule to have in your organization, right? So this kind of an open policy agent statement enforces that, right? It says only deploy images that we know about that come from our personal registry. And that way, again, right, you can automate some of the rules you have around how you deal with the infrastructure. Now, handing it over to Isa to talk a little bit about how does that look like in practice, right? We know there are these kinds of testing tools and there are these kinds of security tools, but how do they actually fit together on a real life project? And how can you not just enforce your security rules with them, but also check that your applications or infrastructure is functional and does the things that you want it to do? So take it away, you said. Thanks. Okay, so uh, as mentioned by Florian, uh, you might want to uh, write unit tests to make sure that your infrastructure is secure. So I want to go a little bit uh, more in depth about one of the tools that uh, we use in, in, in our project. So uh, we use this tool called AWS Spec. Uh, it basically helps us to verify if our infrastructure is configured correctly uh, through writing uh, unit tests. So um, let me give you an example of how uh, you might want to do that. So, okay, so for example, uh, you have an application deployed on uh, instance A, uh, and then this application uh, needs to reach a service that is exposed on say port 8443 on instance B. So um, in order to allow this connectivity, uh, you have to allow inbound traffic from instance AIP address on, on the port. So uh, in order not to expose your service on instance B unnecessarily uh, other than from instance A, uh, you want to make sure that only this port is open to instance A IP and all other IP should be blocked on this particular port. So um, this is where AWS spec comes in. So you can write a unit test uh, to make sure that traffic from other IPs is denied. So you can see in the code snippet here, uh, its inbound is expected to be denied 8443 on, on all other ports. Yeah, so this way, um, if someone incorrectly configured inbound access from other IPs, then the test will fail, and then it will alert the desk that the misconfiguration needs to be fixed. Okay, so one thing to note about uh, writing such specific negative tests uh, is that you might find that there are endless such negative scenarios uh, so, for example, on top of denying um, 8443 from other IPs, right, uh, you might want to deny port 22 so that uh, other people cannot shell into your instance, or you might want to also deny 3389 so that um, you deny other IPs from being able to RDP uh, in, into, your, into your instance. So, the number of negative tests to write uh, may get quite out of hand. So, um, in this case, you might maybe want to instead um, configure some default configurations uh, that help to ensure that no unnecessary traffic can reach your instance. So for example, uh, in AWS, there is a default deny all inbound traffic uh, when, when configuring networking rules, uh, as you can see in the screenshot. Yeah, then you may then consider uh, writing unit tests to ensure that this deny all rule uh, is in place and is, it, uh, is in effect. Okay, so um, while testing the security of our infrastructure is, is important, uh, it's also important to test that the application itself is still working as expected. Uh, sometimes like we, uh, we may be like trying to focus on tightening our networking rules and we might accidentally uh, break our application from working. So uh, definitely we want to write tests uh, to, to make sure that our application is still working. So going back to our example, uh, we can uh, write a unit test using AWS spec to test the positive scenario. In this case, uh, is to make sure that traffic is in fact open on the port 8443 as expected. So like uh, in the code snippet, you can see that uh, right now we are testing the positive scenario, which is that the inbound uh, allows uh, traffic from 8443 from this uh, specific IP address, which is uh, instance A's IP address. So, but one problem um, with 
uh, writing such unit tests uh, is that um, it tests configuration and not correct behavior. So this is one thing we notice about writing unit tests. Right? So what I mean by that is that um, I might have accidentally mistaken the IP address of instance A. So um, I wrote here 10.0.0.1, but maybe in fact, uh, the correct instance A's IP is 10.0.0.2, for example. But in this case, the unit test would still pass uh, because it's only asserting that the configuration is correct. It doesn't know that instance A's IP needs to be correct in order for it to be able to talk to instance B. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of like a limitation uh, about uh, unit tests. So in our experience, integration tests using um, Terra tests so, uh, can help us overcome this uh, problem. So Terra tests is basically a Golang uh, library that uh, it provides helper functions for testing infrastructure. So um, you can see that in this code snippet, we have this helper function, ec2 uh, tcp check. So what this function does is it will search for the instance with the name tag instance A, and then it will shell into it, and then it will do a TCP check to see if it can reach the instance B uh, endpoint exposed on 8443. So uh, doing it this way, uh, even if we did provide a wrong IP address uh, for the inbound rule, uh, it, will, it will fail the test as expected. Because without the correct uh, rules, instance A is not able to hit instance B. Uh, so then this will prompt us to check if connectivity is configured incorrectly and, and, and try to fix it. Yeah. So uh, this, this way we can make sure that our infrastructure is configured correctly and also securely. So now I'll pass back to Florian. Thank you. So these kinds of tools are really effective if you have a set of rules in place. Right? And in large organizations, there is probably a security team that can help you come up with these kinds of rules. Um, you can find these from the community. You can find them in places like CIS. Um, but if you're just getting started with the cloud, for example, then you might not have all of that in place yet. right? But you're probably aware that there are a couple of security things that people often make mistakes on that you want to be careful about that you shouldn't get wrong, right? So probably the most popular one is the open S3 bucket on AWS, right? Many organizations configure their S3 buckets to be public and suddenly all kinds of sensitive information about their users is publicly available to anyone, right? You don't want to make these kinds of mistakes. So there are tools out there that help you with this kind of stuff. Some of them, like a Scout Suite, Prowler, and so on, will just look at your whole AWS account. Right? They scan your whole AWS account, and they find things that are configured in an odd way, or configured in a way that people often get wrong, and it alerts you to these kinds of things. Right? So talking about the S3 example, right? this is what Scout Suite will give you as a report, saying like, here's an S3 bucket that's open to the whole world. Uh, you do you really want to do that? There might be a valid case for that, but more likely you want to keep that private so have a look. There are also tools that operate similar to what we had before on a static analysis, but on your infrastructure as code. So a TFSEC is one of these tools, right? That can look at the infrastructure as code that you've written in Terraform and point out to you some things that you might have gotten wrong in configuring your infrastructure with infrastructure as code. So these are good tools for you to use. Also, and one thing I want to point out here is our cloud providers have caught on to this kind of thing. They want us to secure our systems better. So they're starting to give us tools to do this within their own platform. So if you're on AWS, check out the AWS Security Hub. If you're on Azure, check out the Azure Security Center. These combine lots of different security tools that were, were already there on their platforms, assembles them in a nice way, it gives you a good entry point to look for what these cloud providers think common misconfigurations are, can alert you to it. 
they can also do more powerful things like looking through your audit logs for strange patterns and things like that. So have a look at the tools that your cloud provider gives you. Also have a look at some of the static analysis or scanning tools that are out there. Um, our security professionals that we often work with usually use a combination of these different things to really analyze an account. Um, if you're just getting started, maybe start with one or two of them. Um, see if you find anything relevant out there. So, are we done yet? Probably not, right? Security is a massive field. Um, so we could go on forever. So I just want to point out a few things that are probably worth their own talk uh, that you might want to look at. First is, once you've released your software into production, how do you monitor security things? Um, do you have to write audit logs in place so you can trace um, whether you got attacked or not? Um, can you adapt your infrastructure in real time to react to, uh, to security problems? But how do you monitor security in production? And the other thing I want to point out is something that Isa mentioned before, and that is when you're working with security and audit and compliance people, you're not always talking with highly technical people. Right, So we can make it easier for non-technical people to consume the information that these kinds of tools give us. Right, we, They might need the information in an Excel sheet or in a Word document, right? something that they're familiar with and they can easily read through. So can we use all the automation and all the tooling that we already have in place, take that in and for, reformat that information into something that's easily consumed for another role that might be less technical? might have less interest or capabilities to understand the details of our applications and our infrastructure. So have a look at those things as well, but start with some of the things that we've discovered in more detail. Now, all of these are kind of pick and choose. You can adopt some of these practices and some of these tools and not all of them. And each one of those that you adapt and adopt will increase your security posture, will make your applications more secure, right? So if you're using a combination of the things that we've talked about today, you have pretty solid security automation, right? You're probably doing a job that's a lot better than what most people out there in the industry are doing right now. So congratulations, we are doing quite an awesome job. However, are you done yet? We've talked earlier about how I was frustrated by having to fill in all this in documentation, by having to spend so much manual time, and how developers and infrastructure people, or developers and security people, or product and compliance people often clash on these kinds of, on these kinds of things. Have we solved this kind of problem by adding more tooling? And I'm afraid I must tell you, no. There's one more thing you need to consider. And that is, if you really want to attack this kind of clash of cultures between security, compliance, and development product side of things, you need to start looking at the human factor. You need to, because any system that you can build will only ever be as powerful as the people who are using it and who are interacting with it. So, We'll start with our own team, right? So you've seen my talk today and you wanna adapt, to, adopt one of the tools that, that I talked about and you're excited and you put it into your pipeline. What happens next? The well, next, this tool fails and now your pipeline is spread. And your team is looking at that and saying, wow, Security is annoying again. Right? We've put the security thing in our pipeline and now it's, it's annoying us. It's red, it's green, it's red. Um, this is just another hassle. Right? This is not the thing you were trying to do. Right? So talk to your team about these kinds of things when you introduce them. Talk to your team about how they can make their life easier. Talk to them about this tool might become red. If it's red, that means there's a security thing you need to look at. Talk to your team and talk to your stakeholders about what do you do if that tool is red, if that is flagging a security issue? Who can make a good decision about whether this is a false positive, whether this is a real issue that you need to take care of? 
who decides how fast you need to fix it, whether you need to immediately get a, a fix out into production or whether it's something you can fix in your code and then release whenever the next deployment happens. Who makes these kinds of calls? How do these tools fit into your team? Um, how does a team handle that so it doesn't become a hassle? So it actually becomes something that helps your team be more effective. Right? This involves talking to, uh, to people, this involves influence and convincing. But that's within your own team. The second part goes outside your team, right? Most likely, you won't have a lot of security and con uh, compliance and audit professionals within your team, right? They will come in and have requirements. They might be stakeholders for you, right? So how can you build collaboration instead of confrontation with, uh, with these roles? The key to that is empathy, right? We are all coming at this from different angles. We're coming in with different skill sets, with different motivations, um, with different ways of looking at the same problem, right? So unless we start understanding where a different role comes from, we will, all, we will not understand why they're telling us the things that they're telling us. We won't understand what is important to them and how it's related to the goals that the organization has, right? So start building that empathy and build that trust between different roles of different people in the organization, right? The next time your audit people come around, take them out for a coffee, right? Talk to them about what kind of uh, issues they're facing. Get to know them as, uh, as human beings. Um, see if there's a favor that you can do them, right? See if there's something that they really, really need from you that they're not getting. Um, if you're a security professional that joins a, that joins a developer team and needs them to fix something for them, right? Try to understand their world. What is the product they're trying to get out? Um, what pressure are they under? Um, have they maybe dissolved the, the things you asked them about, but in a different way? And are there ways for you to work together to solve the same problem in a more effective way? Right? Build that empathy, build relationships with the people um, so you can start collaborating and getting to a more secure, but also in a better working relationship between different roles in the organization. So if you're starting to do these kinds of things, if you are really good at that, then what does good look like? Well, in the perfect world, if you're, if you're really good at this, then the day-to-day -day repetitive, annoying part of security and compliance will be taken over by the machines, right? The common stuff will be things that run in your pipeline. Um, you make a change within five, 10 minutes, an hour, you get automated feedback on that change. Is my code still working? Is my code secure? Is my code compliant, right? And it will cover a decent percentage of all the possible security and compliance issues out there. It won't cover everything, but it might even cover enough that you can go to production just with the confidence that these tools are giving you. And if your tools are not giving you that confidence yet, then at least you've covered a decent variety and humans can take care of the rest, right? In fact, in all cases, right, having this, this automation in place frees up the humans in the system. It frees up our developers, our security professionals, our compliance professionals, to do more valuable work, right? The computer is taking care of the checkbox items that we all need to do, and we can focus on adding more value. We can start doing more creative exploratory testing in the system. We can start reviewing source code in more detail. We can work together to see if we can add or improve our automation around security or our monitoring. Um, we can even go even further into the delivery cycle and look at how do we design systems? How do we analyze new requirements? And can we bake security into, into the system at that level to overall give us a better, more secure system that's also much faster and much easier and much more painless to release? And what's not to like about that? That's all we have. Thank you very much for listening. 
And I think we have plenty of time for questions. So please put them into the Q&A function. All right, oh, let me share the screen again. <laughs> and go there. Do we have any questions? I think there was a question. What is the best practices to secure the Ansible? Not sure if uh, someone can clarify what is secure the Ansible means. What? I'm guessing one of the things, right? So I think there are two parts, right? Ansible will always be as secure as the statements that you will write in Ansible, right? So I'm guessing one thing that Isa has mentioned is, right, you can take these Ansible playbooks, for example, from matching the CIS framework, right? And these are well audited and understand by the community, right? So that just gives you a package of security hardening that you can just pull into your Ansible code. Um, I'm not sure if there's a tool that analyzes your Ansible code for security vulnerabilities. There might be, but I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with them. Might be worth looking for that, right? So static analysis for Ansible, that might be something to Google for. Um, apart from that, what you can definitely do then is the things we talked about in, in spec, right? In server spec, in like the rules you can set up in the test automation that you can set up to check whether you whether the effect of your Ansible changes results in a more secure system, right? So you apply the Ansible playbook, then check whatever you're in the server or check your infrastructure, um, whether it still complies with those rules. Um, that was the kind of things that come to my mind when I, when I read the question, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we covered that. Okay, I think the clarification is earlier Ansible is used for automation. However, if this is compromised, it means the entire infra is compromised. Right, right. My guess is this refers to like Ansible uses SSH to, uh, to apply changes to my infrastructure or at least to my servers. Um, if the Ansible SSH key is compromised, um, your infra is compromised, yes. Um, you probably only get around that by limiting how much a single SSH key can do, right? So you have separate SSH keys for your test environment versus your product environment, or maybe for your application servers versus your load balancing servers, things like that, right? That way you reduce the blast radius of, of such a thing. Right? So you're not compromising your whole infrastructure. Um, however, there is that risk. Um, you could also look at, like, do you even need Ansible in, to have access to all your servers? So the way we often build servers is we're not spinning up a server and then applying Ansible to it, but instead we run Ansible to build an image. Right? And then you use that image for your actual production servers. That way, Ansible doesn't need to have access to the actual production service. Anything to add on that, Lisa? Yeah, agree with you, yes. That's, that's also how we uh, do it in practice. So basically, um, just now when I mentioned building the hardened image, is also um, it's using Ansible to build the image only. Yeah, so after that, the image um, is then used to spin up the other instances, but the other instances don't necessarily have to have Ansible. Yeah. All right. Any more questions from the audience? Please continue to put in your questions if you have more questions. Okay, that is all the questions from the audience. In the chat. OK, 
Okay. Okay, so um, I think we can wrap up now. Um, I guess that's all for today from us. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I hope this has been useful. Um, yeah, see you again. <laughs> thank you. Hope this was useful to you. Um, if you have more questions, uh, please reach out to us. <laughs>